And the passage I'm going to read from, um, I chose because it's about place. We started by talking about place and the importance of uh, place as a kind of embodiment of history. And I, th this novel is set in Cambridge, I live in Cambridge, and there is a sense like Florence that, you know, it's, it's a thousand years old, it's small, um, and everything contains this extraordinary layered palimpsest of history uh, that is kind of surfacing through um, the upper layers all the time. So there's a, um, there's a little bit of scrubland outside Cambridge that is what's left of an enormous um, several mile wide field that uh, had or hosted an extraordinary fair every year. One of the biggest medieval fairs in Europe. It's described by people like Defoe, it's called Stourbridge Fair. People would come from all over Europe to sell their wares and uh, to buy things. So it would happen after the harvests. Um, they would set up stalls. So you have to you know, imagine this, this bit of land up near the river where uh, really just heaving with um, people from all over Europe, um, selling glass, selling fleece, selling coal, selling oysters, there was a whole section uh, which, is called, uh, which was called the Oyster Fair, where there were piles and piles and piles of oysters for sale. Um, and of course, those oyster shells are now deep under the ground. You know, they've, they've come up in people's bungalow gardens that have been built on that, on that area. So my novel is uh, set in um, contemporary Cambridge and 17th century Cambridge. The woman who is speaking, Lydia, um, is a writer who's come back to Cambridge after the death of a very good friend of hers, a historian of Newton. The historian of Newton has died a mysterious death investigating uh, a series of um, falls down staircases. And she, Lydia, decides to finish the book that the historian has, has not finished. Um, and of course, therefore, enters this world, this strange world that Elizabeth had uh, begun to uncover. So in this scene, uh, Lydia remembers Elizabeth, the historian, taking her to Stourbridge Fair and trying to conjure the place for her, uh, try to make it, make her see what it would have been like in the 17th century. If you want to write about the 17th century, you'll have to know how it smells, Elizabeth had said. I could hear her voice as if she was standing there beside me. Find me an afternoon and we'll conjure some smells. Then you'll know where to start, I promise. One snowy afternoon in February, Elizabeth had driven me up and down the Warren of Streets off the Newmarket Road called Oyster Row, Mercer's Row, Garlic Row and Swan's Walk. I took scores of pictures through the open window with a digital camera that I used as a kind of visual notebook. Graffiti, overturned bins, scrap metal yards, bungalows, warehouses and corrugated iron. Modern streets built on the site of the old Stourbridge Common, where the mayor and aldermen of Cambridge had hosted a fair since the 12th century. At the foot of Garlic Row, Elizabeth had parked, climbed out of the car, and then, standing in the forecourt of the scrap metal yard, she turned into some kind of historical shaman, her voice raised against the clamour of the industrial machinery behind us. I gave myself up to her. You had to do that with Elizabeth. Use your imagination and get your bearings. It's September in, let's say, 1664. You're standing at the bottom of Garlic Row, which is the main thoroughfare of the fair. A wide, dirt uh, a wide dirt track that runs north in front of you. It's muddy, sticky underfoot. Over that way, northwest, is the River Grant, down which most of the traders have arrived, many from the north, from King's Lynn, weaving their way across the waterways of the Fens. The boats are moored on the river now. Between us and the river are arable fields. The harvest has just finished, so the fields are cropped close. There's stubble as far as you can see and a few wildflowers but there's not, not much room for anything to grow now because already everything has been trampled by hundreds of traders and merchants who have set up their coloured booths in row after row. Over near the river is the coal fair and the tallow fair and a little mound called Fish's Hill. Right in the centre near the mayor's temporary house there's the oyster fair, stalls selling thousands of oysters brought down from King's Lynn and kept fresh in barrels of ice and straw. Between the Oyster Fair and us is Soper's Row. Over to your right are the bookstalls, and behind them the White Leather Fair, and further north, the Horse Fair. Now add the others in their stalls. Think of the trades, the guilds who have come here, goldsmiths, toy makers, braziers, turners, milliners, haberdashers, hatters, wig makers, drapers, pewterers, china warehouses. 
puppeteers and prostitutes and among them all coffee shops, eating houses, brandy shops. There are jugglers, acrobats and clowns. You're standing amongst all the tents and booths. What can you smell? Close your eyes. Brandy, manure, the seawater smells of oyster shells, the perfumes of soaps, tar, tanning, leather, oil from wool fleeces piled around the leper chapel. Smells and perfumes seeped into each other as the sun rose. I walked through the thoroughfares, invisible to the ghostly cellars, running my hands over wool, silk, spices, oyster shells. I felt dried hops running through my fingers, the marbling of books on my fingers, my fingertips. I heard cries, accents from all over England and Northern Europe, men and women from Lancashire, Holland, Germany, Yorkshire, chickens, horses, iron, the chains of scales working, sex, riot and desire. The greatest medieval fair in Europe, Elizabeth said quietly. Now you can smell it. Can you see it? Cambridge is just a palimpsest. All of this is. Just one century laid upon another, laid upon another. Nothing is ever quite lost while there are a few old buildings standing sentinel. Time bleeds here, seeps, perhaps more than anywhere else in the city. You'll see. Now you have to see the chapel. We walked back over onto the busy Newmarket Road up the brow of the hill, where the leper chapel stood facing the road in a miniature valley of its own. In Newton's time, it was used for storage. It was semi-derelict, Elizabeth began, pulling a wrought iron key from her coat pocket and slipping it into the hole in the door. Just think... It's been here for nearly a thousand years from before the city was anything more than a village with a castle and a fort. In the 17th century, Samuel Pepys would have stood in it, and John Bunyan, he used Stourbridge Fair as the model for his Vanity Fair scene in Pilgrim's Progress, which, of course, Thackeray stole for the title of his novel. Now I was late for Elizabeth's funeral, walking towards the leper chapel, lost somewhere in Stourbridge Fair with the ghost of a dead woman and a whole host of imagined smells I didn't know what to do with, and Pepys and Bunyan and Thackeray. Your fault, I'm late, Elizabeth, I said aloud, stepping to one side to let a woman pass who was pushing a child in a buggy and talking on a mobile phone at the same time. We were both talking to the air, to ghosts. Time had begun to bleed in the way that it did around Elizabeth. Yes, I had turned my back on Cambridge and you, Cameron Brown, for five years, but the feelings the city dragged from me were always the same. A physical oppression, a sense of mouldy suffocation and bad air. Low grey skies on most days suddenly transformed to arcs of blue that made your heart ache. Cambridge made me think of Madame Bovary trying to draw breath in the prim protocols of suburbia and yearning for she knew not what, angry with she knew not what. And yes, like Emma, your eyes were never quite the same each time I saw you, black in shadow, brown in daylight, and close up like the stem cell slices you photographed. They had all the richness and variety of hue of medieval stained glass. Thank you.